Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Nearly 12 million Chinese high school students took part in this year's National College Entrance Examination, commonly known as the Gao Kao from June the 7th to the 8th. As one of the hardest exams in the world with great pressure on the students, the Gao Kao has been the subject of a wide discussion over education in China. How does China's education system work? What are some of the problems? And what changes could we see in the future? To find out, I'm joined today by David Moser, Associate Professor at Capital Normal University, Beijing, Flora Liu, founder of Joyview Education, and Professor Li Jin Zhao from Beijing Foreign Studies University. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingduo. Welcome to the show. Well, first of all, to all my guests, probably except for David, you know, have you taken the gold call? I will start with the Flora. You know, what's your yeah. experience, you know, like, and how is it different from today's Gaokao, let's say? Yes, I have experienced Gaokao back in um, 2009. I would say it's not the best experience in my life. <laughs> I gained um, 20 pounds in my senior year of high school due to lack oh. of sports and just way too much pressure. Um, we were told by teachers and parents that we only have this shot. And this would change our destiny. As someone who's from a working class family, I cherish this opportunity so badly. And be, because uh, it is a fair path forward in society, right? So I remember everyone in my classroom was desperately holding fast to this one chance in their lifetime and trying everything humanly possible. Um, so previously, when I took Gao Kao more than a decade ago, students were required to pick either um, a science track or a liberal arts track in high school, um, directing them towards a particular um, subject major at university. Right now, under the new reforms, I was told that students uh, would still um, be required to take Chinese, math, and English as their three compulsory subjects. And they also need to choose one between physics and history and choose um, two subjects um, from the remaining four. Um, chemistry, biology, politics, and geography. I also heard uh, there are changes in some um, area. Uh, for example, there are two chances to take the English exams each year. If a student does not do well in March, they have a second chance in June, uh, which seems less scary compared with only one chance uh, like before. So Professor Lee, it's mm -hmm. uh, getting easier or less pressure? Uh, I think it's getting easier compared to my year. I took it in 1983 and I took it in Xinjiang. In retrospect, the process was really full of anxiety, but the result was exhilarating because for the first time in, in the history of my middle school, we after the, the national exam, uh, I was in the class of liberal arts and 10 out of 50 students managed to get into the first tier universities. So that was a huge success from our personal and school's perspective. And at that time it was very competitive. Uh, so I think uh, the, the rate of uh, enrollment among all the attendees of the national exam was about uh, 20%, but now, the enrollment rate among all the attendees of the national exam is about 90%, 80%. 80% uh, then uh, during COVID pandemic, the rate uh, went up to uh, 90%. So, but of course the anxiety nowadays is everybody wants to get into the top tier, uh, the best universities. Okay, it's a bit different from previously, you know, you want to get into the university, whatever university probably. Right. So, David, you know, as a long time, you know, China observer, how do you introduce like a Gaokao? How do you see this uh, evolution or involvement, uh, changes of a Gaokao? Yeah, well, I, I sort of first uh, came in contact with my students in the 1980s, not, not 1983, but around 1986 or seven. So I think it was probably about the same as uh, Professor Lee's experience. Um, you know, some of my foreign friends uh, think of the, the, the Chinese educational system as sort of very static, traditional, tra tradition bound. But I have to say in my, <laughs> my God, what is it like? 
more than 30 years here watching the changes in the Gaokao, I think the educational system and especially the Gaokao is one of the most dynamic and in flux uh, areas of the, of the economy of, of the country. They're always, since I've been here, they revised the Gaokao so many times, the ratios between the English and the math. And, and in the past decade or two, even more, uh, it's just amazing how much it's, the experience has changed from the 1980s until now. It's, it's incredible. Well, as we said, uh, there are always, you know, a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion, to say the least, about, uh, you know, Gaokao uh, every year. But for this year, you know, uh, one of the controversies probably or, you know, uh, topic most talked about is the essay based on the dream of a red timber. So, Professor Li, you know, like, it, what was your interpretation? You know, what message is this sending out to the education, to what we need to teach our kids or how we teach our kids? You know, by asking some sort of like asking students to, to read this uh, traditional Chinese classics, the Red Chamber here. Uh, I, if I, if I recall correctly, the question based on the Red Chamber is about the naming of a garden, right, of this uh, noble family. Uh, so I think the the purpose of the title is to ask the students to use their imagination to be very creative uh, and to talk about the concept of uh, naming. And uh, I, I think from my perspective, I think that the question is very phenomenological. So you mean, it, because a meaning is very important. So how do you name a place uh, will be very definitive of the nature of that place. So I personally think that question actually is very creative. If you compare the creativity or the, the level of wild imagination of this topic to uh, right now, we, we have seen some of the topics from the entrance, the college uh, exam from France. Uh, I, I took a look at their philosophy uh, uh, exam questions mine, their questions are very, very wide, very, very creative, such as, uh, do you think art can generate social change? So I think compared to their questions, uh, ours are still within the framework of understanding classics and uh, giving your own interpretation in connection with uh, some social phenomena from the present. Mm -hmm. uh, Flora, you know, uh, in the Chinese context, uh, if you read the Chinese, uh, for example, language, Chinese language based like the internet or the media, you know, a whole discussion about this topic, uh, uh, I say here, uh, the dream of a red timber, some people would say, oh, obviously that requires at least you, you have read this uh, piece of a classic, and then, and you can probably do your essay over there. So that's something for a lot of students. Yeah, so in, when I was a high school student, I did read Hong Lo Meng, uh, um, the, the book you mentioned. So if I were to take the test, very luckily, I could easily write an essay about that. But I understand not all people have time to read that because the schedule in high school is just so intense and people just don't have extra time to read extra readings. So, um, so I would say uh, have, have, having students to write an essay or answer, answering questions based on the Chinese classical literature can be both a good and bad thing. Good in a sense that we, it shows that we cherish our traditional culture, uh, we value um, the, the Chinese uh, classics, but it's also very unfair because students just don't have so much time, especially in rural area. I don't think students have access to um, the quality education to walk them through the, the essence of the books. Um, yeah, so no wonder that there's heated discussions on the internet because to, to some people it's just too hard. And, um, and also, even if people like me who can answer the question, what practical value does it bring? Does it help me to become a more civic-minded citizen of the globe? Does it help me to make more money? Does it help me to help my community? Not necessarily. Right. So when we when we take a look at Gaokao, we also need to ask, is it 
that useful to, to prepare uh, for, for the Gaokao? Is it a waste of time for so many students just to read so many stuff and practice all those, um, those, all those math questions? What value does it bring to the society? Mm -hmm. uh, well, David, you know, like uh, either uh, commenting on this uh, you know, particular topic, uh, you know, based on this uh, dream of Red Timber, or in general, uh, the choice of topics, choice of topics to write an essay for the students who join these exams. You know, like, what's your take of that? Uh, how I mean, it's controversial, always controversial. Some people are for it, some people are strongly against. Uh, you know, what can we make out of these choices? Uh, well, um, actually, it's funny because I'm just now starting to try to read Dream of the Red Chamber because I think after 30 years, maybe my Chinese is sort of good enough. So I <laughs> sympathize with the, with the students because it's very difficult indeed, I think even for a native Chinese. I think that the task, it seems like the challenge is that the to, to give the students a task that's that's so in a certain way constricting, it's a very small domain. The idea is to see how, challenge the students creativity, how can they come up with something something new or interesting or eye catching with such a with such a topic. I remember a few years ago, maybe as much as 10 years ago, some student actually wrote filled out the, the essay wrote the essay in uh, Wen, <laughs> the ancient Chinese, the original form of Chinese, the oracle bone style of calligraphy. And there was a controversy at the time. Is this creative or is this cheating? You're, you know, is it just a gimmick or is this actually show the students, you know, ability? And I think the, I think the people who design the test are faced with a, pro a problem of how do we, with so many people participating, you know, millions of people taking this test, how do we how do we allow certain very rare individuals to 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 sort of uh, arise from the from the masses to come up with a very brilliant, uh, you know, original? It's a challenge, and I don't know if. Don't ask me. Uh, I'm just reading, starting to read Dream, Dream of Red Chamber. So, so, I don't so the know. Chinese language, right? Novel, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Um, you know. Uh, Let's compare, you know, the Chinese practice probably with other countries uh, like uh, where you are from, uh, David, you know, in the US, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, the emphasis seems to be not only about, uh, you know, the test scores uh, to get into university, but also about uh, probably extra curriculum activities like sports, music, arts, and even community activities, uh, you know. Right. Uh, so how do you think the Chinese universities for the admittance for the students? probably too narrow uh, when they focus on the uh, scores? I, th I think that in the past that has been a problem. I mean, uh, people compare the, the, uh, the Gaokao with the, the old uh, uh, Keju, the imperial exam system. Uh, you're faced with a problem which is way too many candidates, millions of candidates, and only a few uh, slots for, for each student. So um, in the past, I think there was this problem that it was a very rigid test with very unreasonably difficult, uh, you know, exams. Now, as Professor Lee, I think it was pointed out, or maybe it was Flora, I can't remember, that up to that are you have now a ninety percent participation rate, and many more educational resources, many more colleges, and many more options. And I think that the Gaohao has opened up, uh, you know, for that reason. In the United States, it's very different. We don't have a sort of a a, a one pass test <laughs> that everyone has to take. Uh, but in the, in the United States, uh, and this is, might be of interest to, to young people you know, listening, there's a lot of emphasis on your statement of purpose. In other words, the, right, the, the document that you submit saying why you want to attend this university and what you want to do with your time there is looked upon as very important and maybe of similar importance to the Gaokao because you could have a very good resume and a very good grade performance, but are you creative? Can you think? Can you reason? Can you can you make an, a, a study plan for the next four years? And, you know, I think in the West, we look at that. How, how will the student perform if they come here? Uh, and, but then we have many fewer students to, to be, uh, be uh, evaluating. So it's much easier in our system. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Flora, I know your company, Joy of Your Education, Basically, that's part of your job, right? And you help yeah, with young for people. Yeah, thanks for the advertisement. Yeah, that's our yes. job. <laughs> <laughs> like, how important is it? 
Um, yeah, so as someone who have already uh, taken the Gaokao and who is now helping hundreds of Chinese students go to the top universities in UK and US, I think I can share some of my perspectives. Um, a, a very short answer. I think the, the US um, college admission system admit a human being, while the Chinese system right now, as far as I can see, is admit a perfect score. So there is a difference, but we all know that the student is more than the scores, right? It's a, a student is more than the test scores he or she gets. That there's so much more about a student, about their personality, that their life story, that the struggles they've been through, um, the inspirations, right? And how they serve the community and how they contributed to, in a classroom and to their family. There's so much more than just the score. Um, very interestingly, in the past two years due to COVID-19, a lot of the standardized test centers have been shut down. So students um, cannot take SAT, SAT or TOEFL. Um, but a lot of my students, uh, regardless, when they have not the chance to take the SAT or ACT, they still got into grade schools. How did it uh, happen? Because they shared their life story, because they, through the personal statements or supplemental essays, they showed to the US colleges or UK colleges what a kind of person they are, what kind of person they aspire to be, what kind of value they can bring to this world. So in short, I, I think the Chinese university admission system could um, in a way, you know, learn from the US college admission system admit a student, a human being, not just a test score. Mm -hmm. Professor Lee, what's your mm -hmm. response? You are from this uh, Chinese uh, uh, university here. Yeah, I, I, I partially agree. But again, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Moser has pointed out, because of the sheer size and because Chinese uh, college entrance exam is centralized and standardized, so it's hard to have individual or independent enrollment. I mean, uh, university or college-based uh, independent enrollment. Uh, colleges, universities in China are trying to uh, bring in more criteria to enroll students and talents. And they also have specific programs for enrolling talents from uh, countryside. But still, it's really hard to get rid of this centralized and standardized uh, scores because I think these scores uh, can make some parents more uh, feel safe and uh, confident that their kids can get into uh, first tier or second tier universities without much uh, corruption or black doorism uh, or without much favoritism. So, and of course, I'm talking about this from the perspective of winners. I think that uh, the college entrance exam in China can help a student to develop their true grit, to develop their per perseverance. Uh, whether they succeed or not, if they, they can go through this rigorous process of exam, they can nail a lot of many other obstacles in their life. But I agree uh, with Flora that uh, we should really not just focus on the scores. We should uh, bring in more comprehensive criteria to enroll a student into college. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a follow-up question, Professor Lee. You know, there, there are discussions on the internet, let's say. You know, people say, oh, the Chinese government, all the society is paying, uh, you know, increasing attention to the fitness or the sporty uh, you know, uh, factor uh, for the Chinese students. Uh, you know, sport is somehow becoming a main subject. Uh, you know, probably Chinese math and, uh, and, and the sports instead of English as a main subject for the, uh, you know, high schools in China. Uh, is that the trend or is that somehow likely? Uh, the rumor went on for a while, but now the policy is still uh, uh, having uh, three core scores, uh, Chinese, math, and English. And I think the emphasis of uh, sports is necessary. It's not over emphasis, it's proper emphasis because uh, a survey conducted 
in 2019 showed that uh, 60% of uh, elementary and secondary students were taking in, putting in a lot of time in a private tutoring and uh, 70, over 78% of the students have the problem of uh, getting sick easily or not having enough sleep or, or not uh, spending much time outdoor, spending too much time indoor. So I think uh, it's a very good reminder that uh, students should not just uh, uh, strengthen their mind, but also their physique. Mm -hmm. uh, David, obviously in the US, I mean, sports are a big thing, you know, in, either in the high school or in the university. I mean, there's a, a clear difference between the Chinese education and the US education, probably in that respect. Yes, uh, but but they we don't have the problem in the United States of the extreme, you know, almost crushing academic burden of these tests. Uh, so students, I mean, uh, I think Chinese kids and adults, if given the chance and, and given less pressure, academic pressure, would in fact move towards sports. I mean, people love to exercise. They love to play game, you know, football, baseball, basketball, whatever. Uh, and in the United States, it takes its natural course. Of course, we have certain, uh, we call them nerds <laughs> or bookworms or something right. like, like me who never really did uh, college or high school you know, sports at all. But I, but I did exercise. I ran. I did things. So it's not a problem we have to deal with. The problem with China, China is that there's so much pressure on the kids you know, to pass these, these not just the gaokao, but, but all the tests and these cram courses that they that they have to go through and taking piano lessons and violin lessons that they don't have the time you know to to actually you know exercise so but some i've heard some people say some chinese people my chinese friends say oh great now they're going to have an athletic requirement <laughs> that means the kids will have equal pressure like you know oh we're going to do jump rope so you can bet the parents will hire jump roping tutors and have them spend after hours classes jumping rope so they can get better at jumping rope. And, and so it's kind of a sickness. <laughs> Chinese need to let the kids have some room to breathe for heaven's sake. I mean, that's a problem here, but with so much pressure to succeed, what can you do? Right. Uh, Flora, uh, related to development, you know, last year we know the Chinese government implemented this uh, new policy, Shuangjian, or double reduction uh, policy, uh, aiming to put a limit on how much extracurricular work students are allowed to do, uh, which has basically shut down many you know, tutoring schools, so a year on, do you think this regulation is helping ease the stress levels in Chinese students? Um, I think in a way it does ease the stress uh, on children, but it does not ease the stress on parents because when the, when the supply is cut, the demand is still here, right? People still need to take Gao Kao and people still need to take the, the Zhong Kao, the, the middle school, the high school entrance examinations. And the parents all know that only 50% of the chance their kid can go to a distant high school rather than going to a vocational school. So parents are so anxious and they, they, they can't find uh, outside school tutors. So guess who is helping them for free? So I've been busy helping my relatives and friends, children for free ever since last October, I was exhausted. The reason why I had to help them because they were so afraid that their kid will end up in a vocational school. And let me just share with you one, one story, um, just adding on um, to what Professor Lee just mentioned. So a couple of days ago, a very anxious mom approached me. Her daughter is in sixth grade. And she, she's been having nightmares recently, afraid that her daughter would end up in a vocational school. I say, what's so bad about a vocational school, right? And she said, you know what? If she goes to a vocational school, that means she has no freedom. She has to work two shifts in a factory with no air conditioning. And she needs to try so hard to uh, control her bladders because she's only given twice uh, a day to go to the toilet and each time five minutes maximum. And I was laughing so hard. I, I hope this is not an isolated case. I hope not all moms are, are so anxious like this mom, but this does say something about people's stereotype uh, uh, 
uh, of vocational uh, education, even if they graduate from uh, from a vocational school, even a top one, if we don't have the strong, effective labor labor law protecting the rights of the skillful labels labors, and if there is no respect from the society level towards those skillful labor. Vocational school is still not a sexy idea. People would still work so hard and trying everything they can to send their kids to a great high school, to a great college, and exhausted their friends who can speak English. Uh, Professor Lee, you mentioned about uh, you know the part of the Chinese reform. You know, vocational training schools probably more of them uh, will uh, come out, and you know more cases probably will join there. Uh, say so part of the reason is like technical schools. Uh, cannot fulfill the government's target of training uh, skilled uh, skilled workforce. Uh, according to this, you know, rather drastic reform, 50% of the middle school graduates will enroll in technical schools rather than academic high schools, which prepare students to go to the college. Uh, so uh, traditionally, however, people still prefer you know universities or colleges to vocational education uh, schools. At least the parents do probably. How can we increase this social acceptance of vocational schools? Education is okay in the society, that's acceptable, that's something you can be proud of? Yeah, actually uh, the MOE, uh, the Ministry of Education has uh, emphasized, has launched this uh, law, which is called vocational educational law. And in this new law, uh, it makes very clear that uh, we need to give enough credit and we need to pay enough emphasis on vocational education. Uh, in the past, vocational education students were enrolled or were promoted only after the, uh, the, their entrance into high, a senior high school or their entrance into college. So it gives you the implication that only those kids who do not have, quote unquote, a bright future uh, would uh, choose vocational school or polytechnic school as a secondary choice. But now the reform has made it clear that uh, the vocational school or polytechnic school will uh, have governments more investment, more uh, educational investment, and they will be more uh, aligned with the top-notch technological development in China, with uh, the cutting edge uh, enterprises in China. So these kids will be, uh, after they finish school, they can get right into these uh, enter enterprises and these cutting edge industries and uh, they can have a more decent uh, level of income and living. And uh, more importantly, they can still have the opportunity of uh, participating in uh, college examination, but in the past, they would not have this opportunity. So it means that they are given both uh, much more emphasized in, in more much more emphasis in terms of their social status, and also they are given equal opportunity of entering college if they want to further pursue their uh, postgraduate education or uh, post high school education. Right. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thank you for being with us. See you next time.